All right. Well, I guess it's time to get started. see here. So I'll read from Romans chapter 1 verses uh, 16 and 17. It says the following, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. It's Romans chapter 1. I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity we just have to uh, meet together and study your creation. We thank you for calculus. Help us to understand it a little bit more today and help us to glorify you what we do, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So do you guys have any uh, questions before I get into the examples? I think I've handed back homework to a few people. Anybody not get their homework yet? Name? Okay. Let's see here. And your name? Let's see, here. there you go. Anybody else? What would you like your name to be? Ah, here you go. <clears throat> so, um, just so I told the class yesterday, you know, I'm adding uh, four points to this particular homework because, you know, just that's where I thought the curve should be on this particular one. There won't always be a curve, um, but in this particular one, I thought, since it's the first homework, just to be fair. Mm. All right, so last time we learned the intermediate value theorem, right? So I'd like to look at another example of the intermediate value theorem. It's my example 2.6.4. So like last time, we looked at an example where, well, first of all, let me say the enemy value theorem. IVT, it says what? It says if F continuous, uh, continue, continue, I can't spell, continuous on the closed interval from A to B um, and N, is between f of a and f of b, then there exists c in that interval such that f of c is equal to n. This is the intermediate value theorem. All right? And we used it to... Uh, you know, we used it to solve a polynomial equation yesterday, but I want to show you, we, there's more you can do with it than just that. If you're a little bit sneaky, you can use it to solve equations that, I mean, let me just show you. So here we go. So this one, example one, and it's a kind of silly idea, but it's an important idea to have if you're going to make the most of this theorem. So suppose you want to solve inverse tangent of x equals to minus cosine x. So the question is, can we solve this equation for some x in, let's say, minus 2 to 2? All right. So how would we apply the intermediate value theorem? So in order to apply the intermediate value theorem, we need to have a function, right? So what function should we look at here? What do you think, guys? f of x equal to what? There are kind of two obvious choices. What's that? A negative 2. How about this? What if we do inverse tangent of x plus cosine of x, right? Think about that. If we did that, then what's my original equation equivalent to? So like, notice that the, this, this equation then, right? Star becomes the same as saying what? F of x equals to zero, right? So I invent a function 
where that function being zero is the same as solving the equation I'm interested in. All right? I do that because now I can apply the intermediate value theorem to the function, right? So question, um, it, where is inverse tangent continuous? What's the domain of inverse tangent? The, no, the pi over two, minus pi over two to pi over two is the, um, the range of inverse tangent, the pi plus or minus pi over two not included. Because remember, inverse tangent is the local inverse to tangent restricted to minus pi over two to pi over two. So the domain for the function which it serves as the inverse is minus pi over two to pi over two. But the range of the function on that restriction is actually minus infinity to infinity. The domain of inverse tangent is everything. It's the whole real line. What's the domain of cosine? Everything, all right? In fact, both of these functions are continuous. The sum of continuous functions is continuous, right? We talked about this. So in short, f of x is a continuous function. Note, f of x continuous on minus two to two. Right. All right. Now what? Let's calculate f of minus two. What you got? F of minus two inverse tangent of minus two <coughs> plus the cosine of minus two. All right. And if you work that out in your calculator, you get minus 1.52. On the other hand, if we evaluate at two, what do we get? Well, plug in your calculator after a little bit of button pushing, you'll get 0 0.691. Well, this is wonderful because that means that what? Zero you know, n equals to zero serves as intermediate value, right? For f of x on minus two to two. Hence, by intermediate value theorem, there exists a c in minus two to two, um, such that what? such that f of c is equal to zero, which of course is the same as saying inverse tangent of c is equal to minus the cosine of that same c, right? And there you have it. So the intermediate value theorem is an existence theorem, all right? It doesn't solve the equation for you, it just tells you that it can be solved. And sometimes that's all you need to actually set up a method of solution, right? Like we talked about at the end of last class. Um, you know, if I wanted to go further, right? If I wanted to actually solve this equation, what method could I use? I could do what? I could like, you know, basically I could divide and conquer, right? I could say, okay, here's minus two, here's two, right? I know it's what? I know it's like negative over here. I know it's positive over here, right? So somewhere it's got to cross zero. So I can, you know, I can do what? I can look in the middle, see what's value is there, right? This is called the, this is called the method of bisection. So if I look at the middle of two and minus two, I got zero. What's f of zero? That one I can do without a calculator. Inverse tangent of zero plus cosine of zero is zero plus one. Uh, was it minus cosine? No, plus cosine, plus one, which is one, right? So apparently it's positive here. What's that say? That says that the solution to the equation is somewhere between minus two and zero, right? And then if you want to go further, you bisect again, right? Then you maybe look at minus one. What's f of minus one? I don't know. Um, so like minus pi over four, 
Um, what's cosine of minus one? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what cosine of minus one is. Something weird. But like inverse tangent of minus one, I happen to know is minus pi over four. Listen, I'm not saying to you guys the point of every, these problem, every one of these problems is to do the thing I'm doing right now. So don't just mimic me like it's something you have to do. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that if you wanted to go forward, you could use this theorem as a method for calculation. But oftentimes we just ask a question, hey, does there exist, you know, does there exist a solution on a given closed interval? And so you can apply the intermediate value theorem to find out. Oh uh, man, I'm in degree mode. That won't do. I need to be in. I need to be in. Ah, let me out. Let me out. I need my radian mode on. Let's see here. So do 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 do. Inverse tangent of what would I say? Minus one. Plus cosine minus one. I got minus 0.245. So apparently, we're still negative here, right? So now what did I learn? Where's the solution? Where's the answer have to be? Right. Yeah, applying the intermediate value theorem, the answer is somewhere in here, right? So somewhere in there, there's a zero for this equation. This is actually how calculators solve some things. You know, you can make this a program, and through your calculator, it doesn't take you so long to punch numbers into formulas, right? And you just iterate. You can see how you make a program out of this. All right. So that's that. Now, so let's go on. So I, um, I, I gave you a remark on page uh, 76. I call it root finder for continuous functions. I've been illustrating this in the last two examples. Um, but there's a few places in this course where I'll, I'll show you something that's called a, a numerical method, right? A numerical method is a, it's usually based on some sort of iterative procedure to try to find a better and better approximate solution to a problem. And um, certainly that is one application of calculus that's important. Um, you know, the, uh, the foundations of calculus were also born from these things. Newton himself was interested in these kinds of things and like finding approximate solutions to you know various equations that couldn't actually be solved and you know this whole kind of discussion is really only possible because we have these things called decimal numbers right right if you're trying to do this calculation somehow without decimal numbers how would you, how would it go it would, it would be much more complicated all right but we, we just take decimal numbers for granted. But decimal numbers in their current notation only invented maybe about 50 years before Newton did calculus. All right, so like, anyway. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Let us start talking about derivatives. To start with, add it point. and the tangent line. So we've been um, spending some time getting to know um, what is the limit, how to calculate it, how to define it, right? And I've, you know, we've done some things that are pretty, pretty picky and careful in that regard. I haven't proved everything for you guys, but I think I've proved enough. Um, and so now that we, we come back to what motivated us to start with, which was the fact that to find the tangent line to an equation, we want to think about a difference quotient, right? So let me just give us a definition. I, I hope I motivated this definition in a previous lecture, so I'm not going to do it again today. But um, here it is. If f um, is a function, um, with a in the interior, of the domain of the function. So what I mean is it's, you know, what I'm saying is A is like a limit point of the interior. So you can, you get, you, the, the function is defined at A and it's defined near A, all right? A isn't on like the edge of the domain. Um, then, um, 
we say um, f prime of a is the derivative of f at you know x equals to a provided the limit um, below exists Moreover, in fact, what we say is f prime of a is equal to the limit as h goes to 0, all right, of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. So this is the derivative of f at a. Right, there's a little bit more. In this case, <coughs> y equals to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a is the equation of the tangent line to y equals f of x at um, x equals to a, right? Or you could say it's the tangent line with point of tangency a comma f of a. All right. So a picture of this, right? is something, you know, like this perhaps. If I, you know, wanted to envision it, this guy right here would be, that point right there is like a comma f of a, right? This guy has slope. The slope of the tangent line is f prime of a. And the equation is y is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, right? Tangent line. Any questions so far? Let me just put it out here. There's another way we can calculate the tangent line, just before I forget. And Inevitably, I forget to say this, so let me just make a remark. For certain examples, it's, it may be more or less convenient to use this formulation. So by the way, this, 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 this thing right here is the so-called difference quotient, right? The difference quotient. And so just remark, we can also set h equals to x minus a, then with that substitution, h goes to 0 is equivalent to what? x going to, if h goes to 0, x, goes, x has to go to what? I guess I need to solve this for x for you to see it, right? x equals to what? a plus h in this, if that's the true, you know, if we're saying if I'm putting h equals to x minus a, that means x is also equal to a plus h. So if h goes to 0, x goes to? You guys told me. a, right. And so we can also, we have this alternative way of calculating the slope of the tangent line in terms of a limit of x. So we take the limit as x goes to a, and a plus h is f of x, and, well, f of a is f of a, and instead of dividing by h, we divide by x minus a, all right? So whenever I'm asked to calculate a, a derivative at a point from the limit definition, I've got these two choices. I could either use the x limit or the h limit. And I don't know, for whatever reason, some problems are easier with one than the other. Right? So if you've got a mental block doing it one way, maybe try the other. So let's, let's do some. Yeah? What do you guys want to start with?
Let's do um, x squared. That one's relatively easy. So f of x equals to x squared. Let's try that out. Let's calculate f prime of a. Limit. And you guys, what do you guys want to do? The h or the x? Student choice. H it is. <laughs> so here we have a plus h. What is, so f of a plus h is what? a plus h quantity squared. And then I have to subtract a squared. And I divide by h. Right? Now how do we calculate this limit? Well, How about we multiply out the a plus h squared, right? So that's a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus a squared, all divided by h. Yeah? So any, every one of these limits for the, the, for the you know, for calculating the slope of the tangent line right? The, they're all going to be type 0 over 0. It's just the very nature of this limit we're looking at. Yeah. Oh, did I never? Oopsie. Muchos gracias. The people at home, thank you. Let's see here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, you see, so this is, it's always going to be type 0 over 0 when we calculate one of these difference, when we calculate one of these difference quotients. And pretty much always what's going to happen when you do it, you're going to get like an f of a and a minus f of a in the algebra, and, the a, and that's going to cancel. Like f of a is a squared, right? And Minus f of a is minus a squared. See, these guys cancel, like so. Then we can factor an h out. So let's do that limit as h goes to 0 of h times 2a plus h divided by h. Right? Now I can cancel h. I can, or you, some people say don't say cancel, say reduce. Because people automatically think cancel means 0. But I don't know, whatever. Um, I will say cancel for both, but if you have a problem with that, you can say they reduce. I don't know. I don't think, anyway, whatever. So then we're just left with 2a plus h, which we can take the limit of, right? Plug in h equal to 0, we get 2a. So there you go. The slope of the tangent line to the y equals x squared graph is given by 2a. What's the equation of the tangent line at a point? You guys pick any point you like. Equation, what did you say? 3, three, uh, comma, two. three comma 2. Uh, I take your 3, and um, I think that makes us, we have to put 3 squared next, right? So it's got to be 3, 9. Now, if you wanted to find the tangent line that goes 3, 3, 2, that's a, that's a kind of weirder question, which we could ask, we could try that in a second. And we'll start with this, this one, this one is easy. The question, what's the tangent line of y equals x squared that goes through 3, 2? We'll entertain that question in just a second. Let's do this easier one first. So the, the 3, 9 is a point on the graph of y equals x squared, right? The tangent line through that, it has slope what? 2 times a, which is 2 times 3, right? So it has slope 6, and the equation is simply this. y is equal to 9 plus 6 times x minus 3. There you go. That's the equation of the tangent line. This is not a hard question to be asked the equation of the tangent line. So as you're working problems in this class, you write down the equation of a tangent line. It should be the equation of a line. If your equation of a tangent line has like an x squared in it, you're doing it wrong. 
if your equation of the tangent line, you know, whatever function it is, if it's anything but the equation of a line, it's not what you're supposed to do. There's an important principle here, which is we have to evaluate the derivative at the point. There's also something called the derivative function. We'll talk about that tomorrow. It's really almost the same thing we're doing, but I'm leaving that for tomorrow. The more complicated question <laughs> that Jordan was asking, maybe unintentionally, but it's an interesting question nonetheless, right? Is what was the point you gave me? Three comma two. So that's like over here somewhere, right? Then the question is, is there any tangent line? Is there any tangent line to the parabola which intersects that point? What if I start drawing all the tangent lines? There's one that's here, right? This one. And then there's like 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 this one. And oh, yeah, there should be one, right? How would you figure out what that line is? Um, all right, so the equation of that line is a squared plus 2a times x minus a. That is the equation of an arbitrary tangent line to the, to the graph y equals x squared. Do you agree? Hmm. So that right here, how would you figure out what a has to be in order to go through the point 3, 2? See, if this line goes through the point 3, 2, we also know that 3 is equal to a squared plus 2a times, well, 3 minus a. And that's a quadratic equation which you could solve. And in so doing, you'd find the particular tangent line to y equals x squared, which actually goes through that point. But that's not a point of tangency, so that's a, that's a kind of nastier question. I can't always solve these kind of questions for an arbitrary function. I can always write down the equation of the tangent line to the point of tangency once I can calculate the derivative at the point. Yeah? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. What should it be? Would it be two? Yeah, it'd be two. Thank you. Excellent question. Yeah, because I'm just plugging this point into the equation, right? And I, I chose poorly. Are there any other lines you could talk about through a point um, on the graph of a function besides just the tangent line? Like, so like this one here, right? If I were to graph this, um, that, that's the point like 3, 9. Let's say it's like up here, right? So the, the graph of this equation, you know, it's something like, I haven't done it justice, right? But the y-intercept here is what? Like this is not, this is not a, uh, it's a scale picture by any stretch of the imagination, right? Because what's the y-intercept of this line? You multiply it out, you get a what? You get 9 minus 18, so the y-intercept is actually minus 9. So this distance ought to be the same as that distance. As you can see, my picture's tilted. There's another interesting line that you could ask about here, which is called the normal line. What's the normal line to a graph? So the tangent line just barely like kisses the graph. What, what's the normal line? It's the one that goes away from the graph the fastest possible, right? It's perpendicular to the tangent line. The normal line is by definition perpendicular to the tangent line. So if you were interested in finding the normal line at this point, that would be this guy. What's the equation of that? Well, it has got the same, it goes through the same point, right? It's got the same base point. Isn't the slope just inverse? Isn't, isn't the slope just inverse? Um, that's almost right. Negative inverse, right? So minus one sixth, x minus three. As you can see, it's got a very, a very shallow but negative slope, the perpendicular line. So this right here, my friends, is the normal line. It's 
through 3 comma 9 to y equals x squared. So in your homework somewhere, I ask you to find the equation of the normal line. That's what I'm talking about. It's not a big deal. But let's get back to tangent lines because we got, we got more to do. Let's, let's try out the x limit this time. Let's do, what do you guys want to do? What's that? It's up to me? <laughs> All right. How about, for my example, three. Let's calculate the uh, derivative at uh, a for f of x equals to x cubed. Let's see how that goes. What's that? I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, you can, you can try yourself right now. It'll take me a minute to get back to the board. You might beat me. So you can always be trying by yourself, you know, while I'm writing up here. And then you can see if you get to where I get to, you know. It's always an option. Oh. Or you can just try to write down everything I write. It's really up to you, you know. But I just want you to be paying attention, generally speaking. What works best for you, that's, well, I don't know. That depends on you. So here, f prime of a. Limit as x goes to a of, all right, so we're supposed to do f of x minus f of a, right? So that's x cubed minus a cubed divided by x minus a. So I guess the question is, guys, how does x cubed minus a cubed factor? So if you guys remember that special form trinomial formula I shared with you guys like a week ago or whatever, then you could just rattle off the answer. Or you can look at it and by the laws of algebra kind of piece it together, right? You know an x minus a has to factor out because a is a zero of x cubed minus a cubed. If I plug a in, I get zero. That means there has to be an x minus a factor. Factor theorem guarantees that to me. And there's some other things here that are free. And I mean free in terms of, you don't have to think that hard about it, right? There has to be an x squared here, right? That, that, that has to happen. Because when it multiplies out, you have to get back x cubed, right? And there has to be a plus a squared over here, right? That's a foregone conclusion because that's the only way that I can get minus a cubed back from multiplying it out. So what's, what's left? What did you guys say? XA? So you want me to add or subtract? What do you want? want to try, we'll, we'll try add. I think that's true. If we multiply that out, we can check it. So this gives me a minus ax squared, and this gives me a plus, uh, excuse me, minus xa squared plus xa squared. And over here I get minus ax squared and plus ax squared. In other words, it multiplies out. So what we do is cancel these. I'm sorry, reduce them, whatever. And that gives me limit as x goes to a of x squared plus ax plus a squared. All right. Yep. So how do you know when to use uh, a plus h squared and then just the x minus a? Matter of taste. You could do this with the a plus h just the same. It's just with the a plus h. Um, I don't know, maybe the a plus h here a plus h, we wouldn't have the factoring to do here, but we'd have more multiplying to do. Yeah, I would try one. If you, if it, you don't like the way it's going, try the other. You know. So um, then here, now we can take the limit, right? We get what? a squared plus a times a plus a squared, also known as 
3a squared. So the derivative of x cubed at a is 3a squared. All right, let's find the equation of the tangent line. Equation of tangent line at, all right, you guys give me a point. What do you want? Student's choice. Where do you want to put the tangent line? One comma one. One comma one? Okay, that checks. So the, then that means we're going to have slope, so y equals two, one plus three times x minus one. There you go. That would be the equation of the tangent line because, you know, it has slope 3a squared equals to three times one squared equals to three because we're putting a equals to one, right? There you go, equation of tangent line. Any questions? All right, let's see if I can look at another one here. Example four, what if we're up against f of x equals the cube root of, of, um, of x? So this, this example, a little bit, little bit different. We're gonna look at just zero for this one, all right? So I just wanna look at zero. So what would the difference quotient be What's f prime of zero going to look like? We'll, 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 we'll use the x formulation again, all right? So um, we got what? We got key, uh, limit. Don't forget your limit. Limit as x goes to zero, right? Of the cube root of x minus the cube root of zero divided by what? x minus zero. There's your difference quotient. So then what happened? What, what are we looking at? Can you simplify that? Looks like we've got like just one over, you know, like the cube root of x squared. You could just say x to the two thirds if you like, yeah? Or you could say the cube root of x squared. That'd probably be, that'd be a good way to look at it. Anyway, what's this limit? One over zero, One over zero right? And maybe it's, it's more clear if I write it this way. So we're really looking at like the cube root of x squared. Then it becomes clear that not only is it 1 over 0, it's 1 over a positive small thing, right? Because it's a square of something. So that means that we're definitely going to infinity, right? So here is an example of a function which is not differentiable at 0. I'm not sure that we have the tools to deal with this function away from zero. I could try. I might get stuck though. We'll, we could try. I, I, I kind of want to save this one for later in terms of non-zero, but I want to explain to you what's going on here. So the cube root, it just looks like y equals, so you guys know what y equals x squared looks like, right? That's this thing, right? So the <laughs> squared, listen to me, dummy, me not you x cubed, right? the, the cubic. So the cube root is that same shape just with x and y roles reversed. So it's, it's, it's literally this. Right, this is y equals the cube root of x. And so what's going on here is if I could do it right, right? That point at zero. Okay, so like, you know, the cube root is, in fact, the inverse function of the cube. Do you guys know that? Like, if I have f, 
if I have f of x equal to the cube root of x, it is true that f inverse of x is just x cubed. You can try it out. They are inverse functions, right? Notice that we just calculated the slope of x cubed everywhere. The <laughs> slope of a function is the slope of the tangent line, all right? So the slope of this function is 3a squared. It's zero at the origin, right? Truth be told, if we were to look at this carefully, the, the tangent line right there, right, through the origin, you got a horizontal tangent line. So if we've got a horizontal tangent line for the function, right, m equals to zero, so like the tangent line to this, y equals to zero, is tangent line through zero, zero for y equals to x cubed, right? So the tangent line for example four through the origin is actually the y-axis. However, that's not a function, right? The y-axis fails the vertical line test in the most miserable way possible. Yeah, <laughs> all the time, everywhere. So in short, the derivative doesn't exist here because the slope of the function is infinite. This is called a vertical tangent, all right? That's the name of this, vertical tangent. A vertical tangent is a place where the derivative does not exist and it's infinitely so. There are other things that can happen, right? So any, anytime, um, you know, I, sh I guess there's another part of the, you know, language here, definition. If f prime of a does not exist, then we say f is not differentiable. It's not differentiable at a. So like if f prime of a does exist, we say that the function is differentiable at a. So differentiable means the derivative exists at the point, not differentiable means it doesn't. There are different ways a function could fail to be differentiable at a point. One of those ways, of course, is what I just showed you, which is it could happen in a vertical tangent. Are there other things that could happen? There are. Let us look at the absolute value function. So example five, let's look at f of x equals the absolute value of x. Let's, you know, let's calculate f prime of a. Let's break it up into cases. All right, there's different cases to consider. How about, yeah? When do we choose the h limit? When do we choose the x limit? There's no answer to that. It's a, it's a choice. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. I mean, we could go either way. I'll use the h limit this time. So we've got, um, so there, there's different cases, right? Let's, let's suppose a is positive, right? So f prime of a limit. I'll go, uh, I said I'd use the h one. h goes to zero. We've got the um, absolute value of a plus h, right? Um, minus the absolute value of a divided by h. But the thing is, as h goes to zero, what happens to that? If a is positive, if h gets small enough, a plus h is what? In the limit, the, absolute, the a plus h term is positive, right? So absolute value does nothing. It just gives you back what you started with and you just got limit as h goes to zero of a plus h minus a divided by h, also known as one, right? Do you guys see why that's one or do you need me to write more out? So the a's cancel, right? And then the h reduces. On the other hand, 
if a is less than zero, what happens? You got f prime of a limit as h goes to zero of the absolute value of a plus h minus the absolute value of a divided by h. All right. Think about this. If a is less than zero, a plus h is going to be negative because eventually as we consider the limiting process, h is super tiny, to use a technical term. All right. So like, here we go, the limit as h goes to zero. So what, what happens, absolute value of a negative number is minus whatever is taking the absolute value, right? So I get minus a plus h in this limit. And then how about a is negative, so the absolute value of a is minus a, right? So absolute value flips the sign of what you in input into it because the absolute value is by definition non-negative. So when you stick a negative thing into the absolute value, you, you multiply by minus one whatever's in the absolute value. But then what happens is you got what? You got limit as h goes to zero of minus a minus h plus a over h. The a's be canceling and you're left with the limit as h goes to zero of minus one. See, I wrote the details out for you this time. You excited? So minus one is the answer there. Now this makes perfect sense, right? Because if you think about the graph of the absolute value, what's it look like? It's a V, right? So it's y equals minus x over here, y equals x over there, right? And what do you think the tangent line to a line is anyway? What's you know, what, what is a tangent line if we want to think about it in terms of like a numerical methods kind of viewpoint? It's the best linear approximation to the function at the point. Yeah, so the best linear approximation to a line is the line itself, right? So literally, if I pick any point over here, then like that is the tangent line. If I pick any point over here, that is the tangent line, right? Slope one slope minus one. So unfortunately, this right here though is a problem. Because if we calculate f prime of zero, what do we got? We've got, you know, the limit as, um, let's say h goes to zero, of uh, the absolute value of zero plus h minus the absolute value of zero divided by h, also known as the limit as h goes to zero of the absolute value of h over h, right? This one's kind of funny. You're like, should we use the x limit or should we use the h limit? Here's one where whether you use the x formalism or the h formalism, you'll be led to exactly the same limiting process. That's kind of funny, right? Because if I use the x here, I would have ended up with like limit as x goes to zero of absolute value of x over x. We've already talked about this limit. What does it do? It does not exist. Because why? Because the limit from the right is one, but the limit from the left is minus one. Right? So what does that say about that corner, or it's, some, it's called a corner or a kink in the graph of the absolute value function right here. So on the one hand, from the right, you kind of want to make this the tangent line, right? From the left, you kind of want to make that the tangent line. You can't have both, right? Neither are a good approximation to the function near the point, pretty much, right? So the answer here is the tangent line does not exist at the origin. So here, f prime of zero does not exist. Um, you know, y equals absolute value of x has, usually people either call it a kink or a corner in its graph. So that's another way that the derivative may fail to exist. All right. All right, let's get back into the examples where it does exist. Let's work out some more positive examples. Yeah? Oh, 
I don't know if I ever moved. <laughs> I guess I did. I just don't remember coming back here. But apparently I did. All right, good. So, um, let's look at like something that's not quite a basic function. Let's look at something a little bit kind of more, in some sense, ad hoc. And uh, I should do at least one where I'm not using A. All right. So let's, let's look at um, example six. Let us study f of x, say, square root of uh, 3x plus 8. And, you know, let's, let's find f prime of, uh, oh, I don't know. Let me think about this. Uh, how about 1? All right. Now we can, again, we can either go with the H formalism or the X formalism. I'll let you guys choose. What do you want me to do? H or X? Do the X one? Sorry, you, you got to be faster. F, F prime of one. What did I say? I've already forgotten. <laughs> I'm just picking one, X. <laughs> x goes to 1. Um, okay, so square root of 3x plus 8 minus f of 1. What is f of 1 here? Square root of 11. Divided by x minus 1. How do we solve this limit? Well, if you did your homework, you've seen stuff like this, right? You've wrestled with it already. So a lot of the patterns that you were dealing with in the homework, especially the later part of it, were exactly to prepare you for this event. So what we do is we add the same thing. So basically, uh, you, you could call this like conjugating the radical. I mean, I, I don't know, it's, it's essentially the same pattern you were taught in like high school algebra to like bring square roots out of the denominator or whatever, right? Anyway, that is the trick. And if we do that, what happens is what we get square root, I'm going to write out the uh, in between step here. So that gives us square root of 3x plus 8 quantity squared, right? And then minus the square root of 11 squared divided by x minus 1 times the square root of 3x plus 8 plus a uh, square root of 11. Now, what, I mean, what I didn't write down, right, I just did this in my mind, is that the cross terms, right? The, the square root of 11 times 3x, square root of 3x plus 8, and the square root of 3x plus 8 times the square root of 11, they're respectively the same terms, but one has a minus and one has a plus. Those cancel, and they just leave us the squared terms, which is kind of the whole point of the trick. It's reverse engineering the difference of squares formulas, right? a squared minus b squared is a plus b times a minus b. We are capitalizing on that pattern to make the simplification. And once we do that, of course, the square, you know, the square gets rid of the square root. And what we got? We've got ourselves a 3x plus 8 minus 11 divided by x minus 1 times the square root of 3x plus 8 plus the square root of 11. All right, so then that is the limit as x goes to 1 of, how does that? top simplify, that's actually going to be 3 um, times x minus 1, right? Do you guys see that? So like upstairs, 8 minus 11 is minus 3. So there's a common 3, I can factor it out, that gives me 3 times x minus 1. 
which is beautiful because finally after these many steps we've come to the point of doing algebra enough to reduce the indeterminacy. See, this has been type 0 over 0, type 0 over 0, type 0 over 0, still type 0 over 0, but one algebra step to go and it will become not an indeterminate form, but a determinate form. Woohoo! And then we can just plug in 1. So we've got 3 over the square root of 3 times 1, which is 3, plus 8, plus the square root of 11, which is equal to 3 over 2 times the square root of 11. So there you go. That's the slope of the tangent line to the, you know, y equals square root of 3x plus 8 graph at 1. Yep. If you did it the other way, would you get the same answer? Yeah, if you did it right. All right. So, why did Newton do calculus? <laughs> like, what was... Was he just trying to find tangent lines to graphs, or was there something else he was interested in? You guys, like, we don't know who Newton is. You know, we only care about Taylor Swift. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put that on you. I know you're not Swifties. Okay, just checking. I've heard tell of a Swifty in a higher level class. <clears throat> I make a lot of Taylor Swift jokes in my college algebra, mostly about people, you know, whenever, whenever we're looking for an X, like it just suggests a Taylor Swift joke. So. <laughs> Something about a blank space. <laughs> I think you're leveling up my, I have to think about that. I, I don't think I've used that one. Let's see here, so um, anyway. Let me talk just a little bit here about motion in one dimension. AKA kinematics. So, in short, we can think about x equal to the position. It's the position of some, some object, all right? And then, if you want to cal calculate average velocity, what you do is you calculate the change in position over the change in time. So, in particular, you might have like x of t2 minus x of t1 divided by t2 minus t1. This is the so-called average velocity. So you just take the, you just divide the so-called displacement by the duration, average velocity. But we can do better, see, because if we take the limit um, as, let's say, delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t, Right, that gives us V. So this is the so-called instantaneous velocity. So you'll see this kind of expression written in physics books as if it, as if it means something. But what they actually mean by it is the following. The velocity at time T is equal to the limit as uh, H goes to zero, let's say of x of t plus h minus x of t divided by h. Or if you like, I could re-express this in terms of the uh, delta t. So the, the increment of time going to zero, and you're looking at the position at time t plus a little bit of time, delta t, you know, uh, minus the, t the position at time t, all divided by delta t. So there you go. That's how we actually calculate instantaneous velocity at time t. It's, it's the derivative, right? So if we can calculate the slope to a graph, right, we can also calculate the, uh, the velocity of a position function. <clears throat> 